Hello, everybody. This is Megan. And this is Alana. And welcome to Tea Time Crimes. Halloween edition. And it's actually Halloween. Hallow's Eve. Happy Halloween. Alright, happy Halloween if you're listening to this on the actual release Woo! date. If not, happy random Tuesday in a random year. How are you doing, Alana? I'm doing great. I love Halloween. I mean, my side of the Halloween line, which is more Halloween town <laughs> vibes, to be clear, than like <laughs> The Exorcist. I just want to put that out there. I got my candy. I'm going to give out to kids. I, I, I love that part. I'm going to put on like... You're going to give out kids. That's what it sounded like you said. Give out candy to kids. Oh. You know, like okay. the Halloween. <laughs> yeah. I was, I've been learning so much about it from a bunch of podcasts. Like our new friends? Yeah. That I Shall Not Suffer. They have a great one that was released a few weeks ago all about Halloween and the history. And then I also found another podcast just called Witch. It's produced by the BBC, and it's more around the modern-day witch, which has been really cool to learn oh, about, cool. too. So, We should link yeah. both of them in the source notes. Yeah. Somebody remind remind me. So I guess you. <laughs> uh, Slappy, get on that, please. <laughs> Slappy? You need to earn your How internship. How about you earn your paycheck you don't get, you little... Oh, cool. Oh. cool. Uh, Slappy earned everything yeah. when he was in no. bed with you a couple no, weeks ago. No, he lost everything. Uh, I, we don't have a good relationship, okay? I love him when he's scaring someone else. Well, do you have any big updates for us? Any new animals? Find a llama in your backyard or <laughs> You know, I don't really chill. want a llama. A lot no, of the other spit. things that we've gotten, I'm down with. Bunny. I mean, not really the iguana. What was the other thing we got? Possums and, and Possum. stuff. Like, yeah, I love their little hands. But yeah, they spit. And I. it's kind of with, like with some reptiles, I can't predict what they're going to do. You know, with mammals, you can. But with llamas, I feel like I can't predict what they're going to do and how they're feeling. And so I feel like they bite and they spit. So I'm like not a big fan. I know people really are like with llamas. And what's the other one that's alpaca? But I'm not. If you're thinking about gifting me one, give me a horse (laughs) instead or a sheep or a goat. Please cancel your Amazon llama order to uh, (laughs) Tea Time Crimes. I went through a drive through safari once and the window was rolled down and a llama walked right up to it, spit on me directly (laughs) in the face. But also some of the spit splatter got on Brad's car and he was far more concerned with that and told me over and over how hard it was to get it off of his vehicle. And I said, yeah, I know. It's spit. I had to get it off my face, but it's sticky. It's not watery spit. Stop. Yeah, it was gross. And it had a color, which was was (laughs) stuck in my hair for a hot minute. God, I would have cried laughing, probably peed myself. If I was in that Jeep with you. Yeah, it was a good time. Oh my God, I wish I was there. Oh. Yeah, it was, it was, I mean, I appreciate it. I would have laughed as well had it not been my own face. Right. I'm pretty, sh- pretty sure Roger was there laughing pretty oh, hard. I'm sure. Well, do you have any favorite Halloween traditions that you like to do? We try to do a family costume every year for as long as our son will let yes! us. Yes! You guys are so good at that. Yeah, so today, Wizard of Oz, which Woo! my son... My son picked, which is, I mean, so retro. And he also did a great be- job drawing the Wizard of Oz on that Pictionary game. He was better yeah. than a few people, we'll say. Every <laughs> we, we played Pictionary when we were together, and he's better than all of us. That's hands down. Yeah, so we do that every year. What about you guys? Just really binge on candy, hand it out, and mm. then watch some fun things. Uh, you know, Brooklyn Nine Nine, the Halloween episodes. They'll just like they have oh, yeah, them in fun. the category. They'll just like on Hulu or whatever. They'll just have all all the Halloween. When, sometimes we'll do that one, and then uh, otherwise just like tame Halloween movies. But yeah, we do a bunch of Halloween movies leading up to it. We we do m- way more for Christmas. But yes, you do. for Halloween we have you know. A list of stuff that we watch, but we're not really scary. Well, I think Brad would be. I'm not into scary stuff either, so it's mostly yeah. hocus pocus. Maybe we should just switch. Our, Excuse ourselves. me. 
Like, what? Can, what? Chris can go over and watch Scary Moves with Brad, and you can come over and we are can you, watch Cozy Are movies. you suggesting a spouse swap where you and I are together? I mean, if it works. You know. I'm all in. What do they call that? Bye, Brad. Co-partnering? No. Co-parenting? Mm-hmm. I don't know. I don't think. That's... No, no. People are doing it more. I, I read an article about how friends are like, you know, fuck men or like fuck women, whatever. What? That's how parents begin. When they're saying like they're, they have a child and they're divorced from their parent, they're divorced from their spouse. But and then their friend has another kid and they they move oh. in together to save on bills and raise their kids together. I even see. Though I they're see, not I see. like romantically involved, like just friends. Cool. Wow. I mean, right? It kind of sounds like a great time. It's kind of sounds like a coven. Let's go get yes. together now. You'll have to share the guest room with Slappy, but it is all yours. No. He, he'll all be right. dead. I look <laughs> forward to your I'll win. And Slappy's demise. Even Slappy has soft parts. Oh, God. Okay. Well, why don't you transition us into your tea? Oh, yeah. Because I've got the last spooky episode of the year here. I know. I had to get a protective tea. Okay. So we're going mm. with. Sunshine Cottages, who we remember from last year. My old haunt. My first job. Yeah. It's the White Wizard Tea. Not really a Gandalf kind of feel, but more of a more of a like a Halloween-y wizard. So it's a strong black tea, a hint of cinnamon, and smooth white chocolate. It's Mm. positively magical. Yeah, it sounds it. Oh my god. It has calendula in it. Oh no. Black tea, calendula, <laughs> jasmine, safflower, sunflower, uh, and then the other things I read. Is it calendula? Do we yeah, know what the real but pronunciation is? It's more is? fun to like really, you yeah. know, let it flow. It's more fun to be wrong. No. Let, let me know, bet, Auntie, how I we did. I bet in another language I'm saying it right. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Calendula. I, ro- I rolled my eyes for the audio. Calendula. That didn't get up. All right. Well, give it a try. I, it sounds All right, delicious. White wizard. It smells... Well, I'm glad it has an aroma. Like cinnamon. I know that's one of the ingredients, but I feel yeah. like the white chocolate would overpower it. So it's White chocolate's not that strong. Mm. Have you ever had a Milky Bar? It's mostly just cream, white chocolate. M- milky Bars are very intense. Okay, let's, let's get into this. Ooh. All right, so it like... Starts to sizzle like sizzling magic with the cinnamon, and then it goes down as like a energy beam with the white chocolate. It's very smooth. Wow! I really uh, this is a great first sip. I hope the second and third are good. Do you have milk in it? Just a touch. That's what mm, you always say. This feels like a spell in my mouth. <laughs> Seriously. I know. I just. This is I love perfect. it. This Great. is a really good. I I was very unsure how I would like this tea because like I do like white chocolate, but you know I don't really like sweet teas. Well, sure. Yeah, but she blended it really well. This is you get the again the, the little spice from the cinnamon and then smooths it out with the the white chocolate. So well done. I'm going to be enjoying this all fall and winter probably. I want to try some. I need some Sunshine Cottage tea in my life. Have you gotten a diffuser yet? I wonder if I get an employee discount. Mm, an no. employee discount? <laughs> Listen, about 400 years ago, <laughs> I ran your cash register. Okay. I'm in a very witchy mood, but now I'm scared. Wait, did you give it a rating? I've spaced. Oh, my God, I didn't. I'm so excited. Uh, oh. It's a spellbinding thumbs up. Oh, hold on. I Hold on. I'm practicing with the new media board Your here. Sound effects. Yeah. As long as they don't go there we for go. 500 years. Yeah, this will be a long clap. Just just enjoy it. Let it wash over you. I am going to play with sound effects today, which might be hilarious, might be scary, might get edited out and not make sense later on in the episode. So we'll hmm. see what happens. Trying something new here on this Halloween day. Oh, did you see oh. my shirt? Well, no. Look. <laughs> Can't see anything. It's dark. Oh, you got your new Tea Time Crime shirt on from our yeah. Store at- show. Correct. Nailed it. All right, you ready? This is your last spook. You remember last... I, I tried to make this better because remember last <laughs> Spooktober, I had to earmuff you for approximately 27 minutes. Yeah. And I was just alone by myself and yeah. I didn't like it. So I've done away with that and here we go. Here we go. Be nice. Today we're... 
Today we're going to talk about the Tennessee legend of the Bell Witch. Tennessee, go Bulls! <laughs> That's an amazing Brad impression. And every single Saturday that I have to experience the Tennessee Bulls. But the Bell Witch Cave is a place you can visit in Adams, Tennessee. Link will be in the source notes if you're so inclined. And I read a book by Camille Moffat Headley and the current owners of the Bell Witch Cave, Chris and Walter Kirby. And that book is called Bell Witch, The Truth Exposed. I'll reference Ooh. it quite a bit, so mentioning it up front. I also read parts of the first book ever written about this story called An Authenticated History of the Famous Bell Witch by M.V. Ingram. I have a question real quick. When you're saying Bell Witch, okay. Yeah, Bell. I, like, is it two words or is it one word, like B-E-L, Witch? No, it's Bell, B-E-L-L space. Okay. Witch. Got it. Yep. The book by M.V. Ingram, I don't recommend it. It did not age well. Oh, yikes. It's incredibly offensive. Oh, boy. But it did contain the diary of a Bell family member. That's included in the book, and so that's the part I read because I wanted to hear what's supposedly a firsthand account, but we'll see. So here we go. You ready? I'm ready. Okay. In December of 1820, the patriarch of the Bell family, John Bell Sr., was murdered. Supposedly by the spirit of the Bell Witch. Uh. Yeah. John Bell Sr. was born in 1750 and raised in North Carolina. His father was a farmer and John received a basic education. In 1882, that can't be right. No way. He'd be 130. It's like, wow, this guy aged well. Vampire! (laughs) Yeah, no wonder he's haunted. (laughs) The guy's a maniac. He's a maniac, maniac. On the hunt. Okay. He got married in 1782. That's an unfortunate typo that almost made us think John Bell was a vampire. Yep. So in 1782, John married Lucy Williams, and John bought a farm, and Lucy's father gave them two slaves as a wedding present. Ew. I know. Fuckers. It is gross. A young woman named Chloe and her son Dean were enslaved Ew. by the Bells. John and Lucy had nine children, seven of which lived to mature age whatever that is. The oldest was Jesse Bell, followed by John Jr. I always think it's weird when Jr. doesn't come first. But yeah, that is strange. I digress. Drury, which I can't pronounce and we'll Dr- be calling Drury? Drew from here on out. Yes. Benjamin, Esther, Zadok, Elizabeth, also known as Betsy, Richard Williams, Joel, and Egbert. Egbert? Yes. Chloe was said to also have had eight children in total. No. But there's no mention of who the father was, which no. makes me concerned. I hate people. The family, plus Chloe and her children, moved to the Bell Farm in 1804, which is now in the small town of Adams, Tennessee. So Omens first start appearing to the Bell family in 1817. One day, John Bell sees an animal in his cornfield an animal he has never seen before. He fires at what he calls the grotesque creature. Oh. And it runs away. That shocked me a little bit. I forgot we're doing sound effects already. A few days later, one of the Bell children sees a large bird in the yard. At first, he thought it was a turkey. But when he got closer, the bird took flight. Oh. The boy had never seen a bird that large before. Shortly after that... Dean, who, if you're following along, is Chloe's son, Mm -hmm. was confronted by a large black dog. Cute. The dog didn't run away, but instead came at Dean, who chopped it with an axe he had in hand. No. Less cute. The next night, Dean was walking the same path and saw the same black dog. I mean, it's probably just another dog. This time with two heads. Okay. Nobody believes that. He ran for his life. In addition to these omens, lights start appearing. Small orbs of light that they call ghost lights flashing and moving across the property like a shooting star through the fields. All of these sightings put the family on edge because this is a time where you believe in bad omens and witchcraft, right? We've Mm -hmm. learned that. Things only get worse when Elizabeth, Betsy, who's 12 at the time, 
was playing with two of her brothers near a cave on the property, and they see a girl hanging from no, a tree like branch. That. She wore a green dress, had dark hair, and pale complexion. Pass. The children sprinted home. When the family goes to investigate, it's gone. From here, the boys start hearing noises inside the house in their bedroom. At first, they think it is a mouse or a rat gnawing or scratching at their bedpost. But every attempt to catch the animal is unsuccessful. They hear the noise, turn on a light, nothing there. They go back to bed. It resumes. This happened for weeks on end. In the morning light, they'd search the room again. If a mouse or a rat really was there, there'd be scratch marks, right? They're not able to find anything, no evidence of any animal having been in their room. Then the sounds move into Betsy's room. As time goes on, the noises become louder, and they sound more like what they describe as a dog scratching at a door to get out. Then the next thing that happens is freaky. While they're asleep, the covers are pulled off of them. Paired with the sounds of lips smacking and somebody sounding as if they're choking. Ew. Can you imagine hearing that? Okay, this is freaking me out. These noises go on till early in the morning. I would be I would be out of here. Right, right? This would freak me out too. Then they start hearing noises all over the house. Knocks on the walls, on the ceilings. They hear chairs falling over. They hear what they describe as a ball bouncing down the stairs. I wonder if they're just making all this up, though, really. Betsy was bothered the most by the, these noises and this haunting. And one night she fought back. As the covers were grabbed off her, she grabbed them back. This caused the spirit to physically attack her, pulling her hair. Yeah. And she had what they described as welts across her face from a slap. I think she just probably got slapped by her sibling. This is going on for a while, and the Bell family has been sworn to secrecy by their parents. They don't want this getting out. But it doesn't stop. It only seems to get stronger. The Bells reach out to their friends and their neighbors, the Johnsons, asking them to come spend the night and see if they can hear it, to see what happens. Before bed, Mr. Johnson says a prayer, and shortly after they all fall asleep, they hear the same noises. They hear the knocking. They hear the scratching. They hear the banging. Mr. Johnson asks, in the name of the Lord, what are you doing? And the sounds stop. So from this, Mr. Johnson thinks we need to investigate further and starts inviting anyone in the town to help. You have a question? I, who, who, who wrote this account again? This is passed down through generations and parts of these accounts were written by descendants of the Bell family, people okay. who were there, one of those sons. But we're going to get into it just like we did in all of our cases, so sit tight. People start coming by to talk to this entity. At first, the spirit would communicate with knocks. For example, how many horses are next door? Three knocks means three horses. Betsy is still getting the brunt of this, so much so that she starts to spend the night at other people's houses, but whenever Betsy leaves, the spirit will follow. When Betsy's friends, Feeny Thorne and Becky Porter, which are the weirdest <laughs> names, because Becky Porter does not sound like 1800s, and no, Feeny Thorne is killing me, they witness Betsy go into convulsions. They hear her get slapped. A red handprint is across her face, and then they see her fight for her life, but nothing's there. She sounds as if she's being strangled. She probably is having an episode and hit mm. herself. By 1817, the spirit starts whistling now when asked questions as if it's trying to communicate and then it starts to whisper at first it sounds like an old lady begging for help and then it finds its voice and when asked why are you here a disembodied female voice says i am a spirit I was once happy, but now I've been disturbed. After this, the voice seems to get stronger and is heard by more people, not just the Bell family, but anybody who visits. Eventually, the spirit tells the Bell family that their grave had been disturbed and a tooth was missing from their skull. What? So John Bell knows that his son Drew 
had found a skull buried on their land, brought it back to the house, and a tooth had popped out and fallen through the slabs of the porch. All right, this is where they're all making it up from. After this, the family starts furiously digging under the porch. They're looking for this tooth. But they find absolutely nothing, and they give up. And when they do, they hear this maniacal laughter, and the spirit says, I've tricked you. She just wanted to watch them dig all day. It's not huh. her first time doing Get it. Em. Yeah. The spirit also starts to quote sermons as preachers. She'll mimic their voice and argue with others about the meaning of the Bible, which she seems to know very well. Hmm. She starts giving weather reports. Oh, this is great. She, she sounds very, I mean, she sounds very useful. Read someone's past, teleports to visit family members and report back on how they're doing. Okay, this is this is getting to be a stretch. I mean, if Someone that's got true, really this, uh, carried away with that journal. Why are we nervous about this? As the spirit develops more, it's clear that the spirit loves Lucy Bell, the mother and the wife, and dislikes John Bell. Yeah. Once this becomes known, John starts to suffer from strange sensations in his cheeks. He describes it as if a stick is sideways, pushing his cheeks out and causing okay. his tongue to swell. So he feel, it feels swollen. But it comes and goes. Then one day, the voice makes her intentions clear. She says she's there to kill John Bell. When asked why, she simply says, Because he needs killing. Yikes. You better run for your life, Johnny. Public accounts are that John Bell is a fair and hardworking man, but the spirit makes it clear that she feels otherwise. And she's notorious for calling out people's pasts. She can tell when somebody has something dark that they're hiding, and she's called out more than one visitor at the house. Mm. Just saying. When Reverend James Gunn visits the Bell House, he demands to know who the spirit is. And again, she answers. She says she is the witch of Kate Bats. And Kate Bats is a Kate Bats. Kate Bats. Kate Bats is a real woman. She is alive. She lives near the Bells. What? She, she's married to Frederick Bats, who in 1800s language is described as an invalid. Okay. And the couple have a farm, three children together. But due to whatever Frederick's physical challenges are, Kate is in charge of everything, which you know people don't I like. I see what's happening here. This is always a power play. This is always you just accidentally started singing a Moana song. And I, it triggered what? something in my brain. Which one? You're welcome. I see what's happening here. Yeah. <laughs> Open your eyes. Let's begin. Yes, it's, it's Maui. Really Maui. <laughs> Drink it, it in. in. I'll breathe it in. That makes more sense. Yeah. Clearly, we don't know the lyrics. Okay. The family, Kate, the Bats family is described. I am bursting with song right now. Why'd you have to say that? <laughs> I know. It's a catchy song. Oh, anyway, Kate's movie. in charge of everything, and she's very successful at it. The family is described as well-to-do, but Kate's not conventional, and we know and that yep, makes her a target. To tear them down. She's a witch now. Booby dooby boop. But she's not even a witch. It's like she's created a spirit to do her bidding for yeah, her. Yeah, it's the a theory. little creative, I guess. She's described in the book as a lar- that I mentioned, the one I don't recommend, as a large, fleshy woman who is headstrong and very exacting in her dealings with men. It sounds so, like a great rugby player. She's Alana's best friend, and she <laughs> yeah. sounds amazing. But I will say the diary portion of from the Bell family, they describe Kate Batts as kind-hearted and clever, and they knew she was upset when this rumor came out, and the Bell family themselves think it was just another trick by the spirit, and they didn't think Kate was involved in any way. But from here on out, the spirit only answers to Kate. That is her preferred name. So Kate spends her day singing hymns to Lucy, leaving her gifts, fruit, hazelnuts, doting on her. Anytime John enters the room, she starts swearing and cursing. Great. Shortly after Kate said she was there to kill John Bell, he starts to struggle to be able to even eat. He can no longer swallow, and he starts to have seizures. Then the bells start to have additional visitors. So besides Kate, four more voices appear. They are believed to be a family, and they are described as rude and crude. You have the head of the family, which is described as a scary female voice. I don't have a sound effect for it because it was too scary. Thank God. She's called Black Dog. 
Then there are two female voices who are much softer but distinctive between the two. And one is called mathematics. What? And one is called psychography. What? These aren't normal names. They're unique, yes. And then there's a young boy named Jerusalem. That's very confusing. So the Bell family would smell whiskey and then sounds of what appeared to be brutal fighting would break out. At this point, John Bell is ill. He hasn't had a good night's sleep in what feels like several years. He's completely ready to abandon the farm and run. Good. But the spirits tell him that would be pointless because they'll just follow him anywhere. Following the family visiting, Betsy Bell goes to visit her one and only sister. When she arrives, the two Bell women see the witch family in human form. A woman walks down the drive, who they assume is Black Dog, sits on the fence. Two girls and a boy join her. The four start jumping on sapling trees, and they're playing, and you can see the trees moving up and down, bouncing. What? The husband, Alex Porter, returns home. The Bell sisters are freaking out, pointing to this family that's jumping all over these sapling trees. He can't see anything. All he can see are the trees moving. He gets a gun at the sisters' urging, and he shoots where they tell him to shoot. Everything vanishes. That night at the Bell home, Kate starts chatting. They must, like, just set her a place at the table. She's just there to have conversation. She says, Alex is a good shot. He broke Jerusalem's arm. So she claims that even though Alex was pointing or was shooting into nothing, that he hurt the little boy's arm. Other people are still coming to the Bell house to talk to Kate. William Porter, who's a friend of the Bells, would spend nights there sometimes trying to help the family figure out what's going on. Hmm. And he liked to talk to Kate, and Kate liked to talk to him. This is my favorite story. He lived close to the Bells. Fabulation, ghostly style. Yeah, ready? One night, he hears Kate in his own house. She crawls into bed with him, and she says, this is a quote, Billy, I've come to sleep with you (gasps) and keep you warm. (laughs) Buckle up, Billy. Oh, that's a otherworldly experience. Uh, the covers start to move as if someone has gotten into bed under the covers with him. He grabs the form that are in the sheets and he runs to throw it in the fire. Oh. As he moves out of bed, the shape starts to change from human form to what he describes as a writhing snake. Oh. A foul o- odor then rises from the bundle that is so overpowering he's forced to drop it and run outside for fresh air. Yuck. Seems like you could have leaned into it, Billy, and had a much better experience than that. <laughs> By now, people are visiting from all over, not just their little town. They're making potions, performing rituals to get rid of whatever is on the property of any paranormal entity. And every single time they try, they end up running away from the property in terror. Folks are also traveling just to ask her questions or to try and catch her or prove that the bells are, like you said, making it up. Even Andrew Jackson was said to have visited. Hmm. His wagon of soldiers got stuck in the mud. It was only released when they heard a disembodied voice say, okay, you can go now. Betsy continues to have the worst of it and nothing is helping. Kate won't leave her alone. She's choked, pinched, hit, pricked. The wounds are appearing on her body. Her siblings are seeing them. Yeah, because John's doing it to her. In 1819, John Bell's health was getting worse, and Betsy became engaged to Joshua Gardner. According to the authenticated history of the famous Bell Witch, this is how they describe Betsy. Ready? Get ready. to. You're going to do a real choking sound. Betsy had developed rapidly and at the age of 15 had ripened into lovely young womanhood and was noted for her extraordinary beauty and winsome ways. Ugh, get bent. Kate doesn't approve of the engagement to Joshua, which makes me think, what did you do, Josh? Because despite Kate's faults, she seems to have a pretty strong moral compass for vigilante justice, and she tells Betsy not to marry Joshua, and they break up over it. In the fall of 1820, John Bell goes outside to work on the farm, and he's found by his son suffering a seizure. He became worse over the next few months, and he died on December 20th, 1820. Oh, well, then we're all good. His son found a vial by his bedside, a vial that was not his medication and had a strange smell. John Bell had that same smell on his lips. Kate speaks up and explains she's poisoned John Bell, and then erupts into laughter. It was discovered that the vial contained arsenic. 
Hmm. During his funeral, Kate was said to be sitting in a tree, singing, drinking songs, and celebrating. Now, after the death of John Bell, the activity changes considerably. Kate was there, but not as confrontational. Assuming it's now safe, Betsy and Joshua reunite. Oh. Kate does not love this. And she tells Betsy she better call it off. She's quoted as saying, Please, Betsy Bell, don't marry Joshua Gardner. This will surely bring you a life of pain and misery. So Betsy's afraid that Kate's going to then kill Joshua. And so to save Joshua, she breaks up with him. Hmm. In June of 1821, Kate says goodbye, but that she'll be back in seven years. Seven years. Mm -hmm. Lucy remains in the house until her death, and then the house sits vacant for years until it is torn down. Betsy Bell goes on to marry a man named Richard Powell, who's 11 years her senior and was her school teacher. They have several children together, but Betsy will outlive all but two. Four die as young children, one dies as a soldier in the Civil War, and another dies as a young man. Richard oh, man. also suffers a stroke early on in their marriage, making Betsy the default caregiver <sighs> and stopping him from earning a living. The couple decide to make one big investment with their money in a shipment to New Orleans, and the ship carrying this investment sinks, oh. leaving the family destitute. Oh, so Betsy's forced to deal with the grief of outliving nearly everyone she's yeah. ever loved. Oh, and although yeah. she's, she is never physically attacked by the spirit again, the mental trauma remains, and Betsy Bell refused to sleep alone for the rest of her life. I'm with you, girl. Right? It's too scary otherwise. Sharing a bed with grandchildren, even in her old age, and always making sure her back was to the wall. Oh. Drew Bell, the one who found the skull, was so scared of Kate coming back that he spent his life keeping to himself. He was terrified. He was also a slave owner and purchased a woman named Caroline for $400 and a her two-year-old son. He is said to have fathered three children with Caroline. Dude, I hope he had the worst death and I'm glad he was scared his whole life. Cave Fucker. Johnson, okay. Cave Johnson Bell, Codney Bell, and Bolin Bell. They lived unofficially as husband and wife, and Caroline states Drew is the father of the three children in official documents that histori historians have now found. Yeah, I'm sure it was consensual. I want to mention it because there's a lot of pressure on Bell descendants, and these children were also Bell descendants. In 1828, Kate swings by again. She's back. She visits John Bell Jr. for three nights, and she's just shooting the shit. She's discussing the future of the world. It sounds like a lovely visit. <laughs> Making several predictions that, in fact, come true. One, she tells them about the Civil War. Correct. Two, she tells them about World War II. Nailed it. Three, she tells them about the Great Depression. Also correct. Four, she tells them about World War II. These are a few of the things that she tells them will occur and you when they're World going War to II happen. twice. Sorry. World War I, hmm. the Great Depression, and World War II. Now... There's some other stuff thrown in there that hasn't happened yet, like the impending destruction of planet Earth, saying that it'll come to an end by way of fire. Well, Whether she means nuclear war or global warming is up for debate. She basically tells John Bell Jr. that there is hope, but when humanity fails to help each other and is motivated by only greed, that will be the end. Tale as old as time. We're no. heading towards the end, folks. She seems very wise. So before we go too far into the present day experiences at the Bell Witch Cave, because it's still haunted, I want to stop and talk through some of the theories around what actually happened in the Bell home, because I know Alana wants to bust it up. Yeah. John Sr. is abusive and Betsy is trying to figure out ways to cope with it. So she's making up a lot of stuff. Well. And whoever wrote all this shit down, it can obviously say like, yeah, all these other people experienced it too. I mean, there's not like there's interviews on camera exactly but let's go through this, the theory so one is of course that kate bass is somehow involved kate was said to have been a witch around town and she would take women's pins like hair pins or hat pins mm -hmm. to have control of them <laughs> oh boy the town kept her at a distance now there are some what they described as odd stories i find them rather hilarious about kate bass for instance Apparently, she would show up late to church service often, and she showed up late one day, and a gentleman was on his hands and knees doing what? some sort of, like, 
getting rid of some sort of evilness. I don't know. Oh it sounded dicey. She sat on him. <laughs> and they were like. Is this seat taken? <laughs> yeah. It, they were like, you need to move. You're hurting him. And she she said, but I'm pretty comfortable. And they said, well, you're you're crushing him. And she said, well, then he's only getting closer to God. And Stop. they didn't love that. <laughs> Oh boy! I know. I, that's why I said I'm like I think I just fell in love with Kate what Bats. A peach. Yeah. So I think that Kate's Kate Bats was an easy scapegoat due to the fact that she was not a you know shrinking violet and she was a successful woman who did her own thing. Yeah. Yeah. But the theories surrounding this her being involved were because there Kate and John were said to have a land dispute ongoing, but historians say that that wasn't true. That the dispute was actually with Kate's brother and John Bell, not with Kate. And even, I don't know what we can believe in the diary portion, but even the diary portion was like, yeah, Kate's cool. Other rumors say that John and Kate were having an affair and that John murdered Kate. One huge problem with that, though, Kate outlived John Bell by, like, decades. Okay. So I don't, <laughs> I'm going to have to poke some holes in that theory. <laughs> so that, there's the Kate Bats section of it. I think Kate Batts was just unfortunately caught up in this and she sounds hilarious. She really does. Another theory is that these stories were started as an additional control tactic for the slaves on the Bell Farm and surrounding properties. A lot of the slaves were married to another person on a neighboring farm and they would visit them at night. And these stories could have been a mental manipulation that was added to the enslavement to keep them on the property. Yeah, it's probably pretty likely. And then from there, it spun out of control. That's one theory. Another theory is that this was, like you said, just a scam. That the Bell family made it up for attention, Mm -hmm. for money, for whatever. It doesn't appear that the Bell family got any money from this. That that nobody was charged anything, uh, but who knows. But a lot of skeptics believe that, or people at the time believed that they could have been creating the noises and, get this, we're going to have to go to our intern Slampy for the expertise, but that Betsy Bell was actually a very gifted ventriloquist okay, and was the one doing the voices as part of the scam. I also think that maybe, too, they killed John Sr., and so this is also a big cover-up for that. Wait till we, wait till we get through all the theories. <sighs> I don't think Betsy was a ventriloquist because she seemed genuinely affected by whatever did happen to her. However, another theory is that this was just blown way out of proportion, and skeptics wonder if M.V. Ingram, who published the family's account, and he published it late, saying that he was told by the family not to publish it until everybody associated had died. Skeptics say, was this actually what he was told, or did he just not want anyone to refute it? Oh. And did he just make it up for a good story, or did he at least embellish parts of it? Absolutely. People wonder. Another theory is that Richard Powell, who married Betsy, have we not talked about you guys sharing? Is he, are you a descendant of this guy? John Bell hated him, and Betsy was engaged to another man. So was Richard somehow involved in putting on this big scam to scare the family and get rid of John Bell and Joshua Gardner so that he could have Betsy? Maybe. Hmm. If that's the case, though, I really wonder how you'd pull that off. That seems pretty impressive. Mm -hmm. All right. The last theory, the one you've been just tap dancing around the whole time. What kind of man was John Bell really? Piece of shit. The spirit made it clear that their purpose was to kill John because he was a bad man. At the time and through the, you know, the authenticated history book, John Bell was a hardworking, honest man. But that truth of John Bell has been washed away with time. Not even counting the slavery, John Bell was charged with killing a man in North Carolina. The manager of his farm made a comment about his daughter, and he shot him. Whoa. It was ruled as self-defense, but it provides a pretty possible explanation as to why the Bells suddenly moved to Tennessee in the first place. Second, John Bell was excommunicated by the Red River Baptist Church for usury which is charging too much, Mm -hmm. said more than likely either for land or a slave. Got it. This is a big deal to be excommunicated from the church in that day and age. And it makes me wonder if maybe something more was occurring and the charge was how the community could get him out. Hmm. And they just didn't talk about it. The third theory presented 
is the one you've been saying and the one I agree with, in several documentaries and by the author of The Bell Witch, The Truth Exposed, although she's very clear that it's her opinion and not the current owner's opinion. Yeah. There's a real possibility that John Bell was murdered by somebody in the household yes. because he was abusing Betsy. Yes. If you look at the facts, there's only three people who seem to really have anything focused on them. One is Lucy, who's incredibly favored. Betsy, who's constantly attacked with physical evidence. So how are those slaps getting there? Exactly. How is she having marks on her body? And then John, who is hated by the spirit. Now, that was my first thought when I read how often the physical abuse seemed to be occurring just to Betsy alone. And here is a tidbit that made me feel even more strongly about this. Would you call it a titty? I would not. I would call it a tidbit. <laughs> we'll throw back to last or two weeks ago. It is not common knowledge, but John Bell was 32 when he married Lucy. Lucy Don't was 12. It. Don't say it! Ah! Which is the exact same age that Betsy Bell was when all of this started happening. Fuck right off. Fuck. This would also explain John Bell's slow deterioration. He died from arsenic poisoning. Someone had most likely been gradually been poisoning yep. him. Have we seen? Starting at the onset of his symptoms. This could have been Lucy. Could have been Betsy. It could have been one of her brothers. It could have mm -hmm. been a slave on the property. Mm -hmm. It could have been a combination. They could have been all in it together. Yeah, like the Orient Express. Oops, spoiler. Well, it's been out for like 50 years, so. <laughs> Do you want to ruin the sixth sense while we're here too? <laughs> and the thing I wonder is it's not mentioned at all, but there is another sister in the Bell family. I wonder what happened to her. And then also we know Chloe has children. I know, and that's absolutely rape. That just widens the Ugh. suspect pool, right? There could be so many people, if this is true, and this, again, is just a theory, but if it is true, there could be so many more victims of this than just Betsy Bell. Yep. Because it seems that if he married Lucy at 12, that seems to be some sort of triggering age for his actions, if this is true, and imagine all of the people he would have at his disposal. Yeah. Yeah as the, the one in, in power. Mm. To this day, descendants of the Bell family have very strange experiences. There is said to be a curse on the firstborn son of each Bell generation, and you can watch the show Cursed, the Bell no. Witch, to learn more on Annie. I know you won't watch it, but throwing it out there if anybody wants to. A medium on that show backs up the last theory as well, and she says that's what she thinks happened. Bob Bell, who is a descendant, he lives in the area still. He's on a lot of these documentaries, and he talks about it. Hi, Bob. Yeah, he's cool. He didn't believe in ghosts at all, but he's had several strange experiences throughout his life that freak him out. So much so where he's gone looking with a gun through his house and can't find anybody there. He relayed that his grandmother, so it seems to follow the Bell family, was upstairs taking a nap. She heard a very loud noise. She goes downstairs and all of the plates from the china cabinet are on the floor. Earthquake. But they're not broken. They're perfectly laid out, equidistant from one another. Some people do the weird things when they sleepwalk. The curse on the descendants is supposed to be a thing. There's also, you, you got you to gotta treat this, these entities with respect. In 1950, three boys drove from Nashville to the gravesite of John Bell. They stole a headstone. On the way home, the car crashed and the driver was killed. Whoa. The two other boys were severely injured and John Bell's tombstone was the only thing in the car that remained unscathed. Jeez. Now, current day, Chris and Walter Kirby bought the property in 1993. It's a different house. It's just on the property, right? The original house right, they was tore it down. torn down. So it's still the property, but they're like, yeah, okay, you know, whatever. The first night there, they're woken up by an incredibly loud noise, sound of breaking glass. It sounded like somebody dropped something, like a glass pitcher. They go down to investigate, fully expecting that one of their many moving boxes was toppled over or had mm -hmm. fallen over or something. Nothing's out of place. Next morning, a book about the Bell Witch had been left to them from the previous owners, and it's opened to a section called Breaking Glass, explaining the common sound that many people hear when staying on the property. Yeah, this is all. They read the After book. After that and first night, it up from it. Mrs. Kirby, her name is Chris, would hear noises constantly throughout the day glass breaking, sounds of someone in the house, things being dropped, banging, the hum of people talking, and nobody's ever there. The source of the haunting is agreed in present day to come from the cave on the property. 
which you can get tours of. Agreed by whom? Now called the Bell Witch Cave. So this cave has two sections. The first is where a Native American girl of a very young age, probably under 10, was buried after dying from a gunshot wound to the chest in probably the late 17, early 1800s. Today, the tomb is empty because some idiots robbed it. I hate people. The second room has tunnels that stretch for miles underground. Psychics, mediums, shamans, several paranormal investigators say that the cave holds many spirits Uh and acts like a portal to the other side. Why don't people go through the portal then if it's real? In the smokehouse on the property, Chris found human remains. Turned out to be bones, human bones, over 2,000 years old, belonging to members of a Native American tribe who had been buried right above the cave. 2,000 years old. That's cool. Yeah. Paranormal investigators were brought in and said to have captured what looks like a door opening inside the cave, a.k.a. the portal. Uh giving further credence to the theory that this is a location for spirits to travel through. Why would spirits need a door with a knob? No, you're being too literal. Mm. It's like an opening. Several things have been caught on camera that are, like you'll you'll be sitting there in front of the Bell Witch Cave, and then when they develop the picture, there's somebody behind you that was not there and is, they don't know who it is. Mm -hmm. There's several of those on the, Bell Witch Cave site. Like the guy who was holding the boom. You know what? You Can you just suspend dis- disbelief for the next few minutes and let everybody enjoy this? <laughs> I'm sure there's <laughs> listeners like me. You grunt. You grunch. Grinch. Grinch. People who go through the Bell Cave, because you can take tours, like I said, have the same types of events that Betsy Bell described. They have been slapped and a hand mark appears. If anybody taunts the legend and says it's not true, <clears throat> they will experience a slap, a pinch, a push that is witnessed right, we'll see by tonight. others. Don't. She didn't mean it. Spirits, please, yeah. please disregard her ignorance. Oh, boy. Cameras will malfunction, either not working at all or going off on their own. Animals react to things that humans can't see. Cats are hissing. Dogs are growling. Breathing is heard from the cave. <sighs> That was on the fly. Any type of transportation will just stop. Cars or horses. Doesn't have to have an engine. Just stops when it gets near the the property. The Bell Cave particularly. And today, if you take anything from the Bell Cave, so it's not a gift shop. So I'm talking a pebble, a rock, whatever. You take anything from it, then you are said to be cursed. And there's many examples of this happening. The Kirby say constantly people come back and return a rock that they took. They gave one example of a woman on a tour, pocketed a pebble. They told her, we do what you want, but we don't recommend it. An hour later, she was back with bloody knees and said something she couldn't see had shoved her down onto the ground and she was coming back to return the pebble. Mm. So what do you think of the haunting of the Bell Witch? I mean, I don't think any hauntings are real. I think it's always, there's always some dark truth in it. And I hope the good descendants of the Bell family are at peace and all of that. I only wish them well, except for John Sr., which I think is pretty nasty, probably. And so, you know, not saying anything like that. But I think, I mean, that my theory is the last one we talked about where Betsy was being abused. And there is a murder that was covered up through all these embellished stories. I'm not like completely, I mean, yeah, I I definitely believe in science and like facts the most in life. You can get sense of like energy and, and vibes and stuff some places. You know, I don't really know what that's about, but I don't believe that every single car, like if I drove to the property, like if, if we drove a hundred cars to the property, they would all stop. I don't believe that. So, you know, when it when it gets to like those specifics, I think it's made up because, you know, it's like it's fun to tell these stories and like to be spooked. I'm sure there's something weird and there's some a lot of history. I mean, it's been found, right? The 2000 year old bones and like the other skeletons that have been found. But I don't know how to say it. I, I do believe that different areas have different vibes and energy, but I don't know what that really means. 
Like I can immediately feel uncomfortable in a certain place, but I don't believe spirits in human form are like hanging around and like doing stuff. I wonder if some combination of things might be true. You know, maybe they did experience strange things that may or may not be explained. Like maybe those lights are, what do you guys, you guys get them in New Orleans, like swamp lights or something? Oh, 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 like the lights to move around? Yeah, yeah, like there's probably things like that that were happening. And, you know, seeing a bird you've never seen before isn't that exciting. Yeah. But, you know, we don't know what happens after Mm-mm. this world. Science doesn't know. So to say that we don't know anything and that there isn't anything else out there is, who knows? Maybe they thought the place was haunted. And then I think some, I don't know who, but somebody in that Bell family, I think more than one person decided to put a stop to something that was happening in the house that was incredibly ugly and evil. Yeah, that was real. That was real. And then you was using this as a way to help them do it. Yes. And maybe they thought that this would help scare John and make him start to deteriorate faster or maybe get him to run away. or, Or maybe they were hoping they didn't have to kill him because it sounds like he was being poisoned for a long time. Yeah. And I don't know who it was. I honestly don't know. It's possible that it was the whole family. Right. Because think of how small the houses were. Yeah. It would be hard not to know what was going on in that house, I think. Yep. Even if you were if you were Lucy or if you were one of the brothers. I think people, they would have known the truth. And maybe they decided to turn it into something else. I still don't know if people actually heard voices. Again, these are accounts that are passed down through generations. You exactly. Know, the, the current day owners are, have reported their experiences as well, mm-hmm. as well as people in the cave. And who knows? That's what I'm saying. Maybe it, maybe there is a little bit of a haunting. I mean, so many people will share haunted experiences with you in their house where they heard a strange noise they can't explain or they heard a conversation. Who knows if this is hauntings or if this is like old ener- energetic imprints or if it's your mind doing something. But right. Maybe something like that was going on and whoever was in the Bell family just leaned into it and said we... But it went on for three years. Yeah, but like the abuse went on for probably a while. I mean like... That's what I'm saying. The abuse went on for three years. So this was a very slow plan. Yes. Maybe they wanted to see him suffer or like maybe they, they were... Obviously, they were smart and like slowly did it. And so it wasn't like... I don't know. They probably could have gotten away with it. It sounds like even... Though there was arsenic in there, nobody really questioned it. Yeah, they be- they fully believed that the spirit yeah. did it. Hey, fully believed it is the only eighteen hundreds, but is the only the ghost thing. murder on record. Yeah, and because you know, if you think about it, if you break it up, Kate didn't sound all that bad to me. She seems to really draw the line between what is right and wrong. You know, she's not some random bad spirit exactly. that's attacking people. So she's Drawing a line in the sand and saying, you're good, you're bad. It's that simple. You need to pay for what you've done. And that, who do you think it is? If you had to pick somebody in the the Bell family, who do you think it would be that's the murderer? (sighs) It's really hard. Who, is Lucy the mom? Mm Mm-hmm. I think probably her. Because she would have known the most what Betsy was going through. Exactly. And, you know, the spirit, which I think, this is all Betsy. Betsy is the one who's like, whether this was made up later down the road or this is actual accounts, like Betsy's making this up to share how she feels without, without, I don't know, being in trouble for it or like being in danger for sharing like he's evil man, he needs to die. And so I think like it's a, I don't know, not a repressed thing, but like an escape where she can say these things these things. Um, and then I think Lucy probably is the one cooking and stuff and well Right. Do yeah. That. Well, Betsy Bell, I mean a couple of things could have been going on with Betsy. One, she could have been reacting. She could have had having convulsions and seizures due to the yeah. trauma that she was experiencing and legitimately wasn't able to control totally. it. She could also have been seen being attacked by John Bell and they the family decided to make a different story, but with yes. this explanations for why she had that attack, maybe John forced maybe John made up the story, which would be a sweet hmm. irony, right? She also could have been putting on a little bit to make sure nobody found out. Yeah. Because yeah. that's another thing that's common of 
victims who are abused, they don't want anybody to know. They feel, yeah. especially in this time, right? There's no hotline. Yeah. There's no support group. This is something that must have made her feel terrible if, if it was going on. Yep. Yeah, I think Lucy is a really strong bet, but I also wouldn't be surprised if other members of the family were helping. Yeah, I wouldn't either. But I don't know. Still, I think both things can be true. I think a place can be haunted and a man can be bad. But I, don't think I, I have trouble I don't believing know. that the spirit could just talk so easily to everybody there. Yeah, I don't. It seems don't wild to me. Spirits. There would be other accounts. I if I went to somebody's house. And a disembodied voice told me my future and all these things. I would come home and write that down. Exactly. That's what I'm saying. Like, there was no, like, video interview of all these people. But it's easy for this person down the road to say, like, oh, yeah, all these people came over and they agreed. Yeah. You know how stories, over time, stories become more yeah. amazing. Myth and legend. And, and yeah. they uh, embellish. Yeah. I'll tell you what, though. If I were ever to go to the Bell Witch Cave, I would not take a rock. I will, I, and mostly no. because I think that's probably a place where several people are buried, and it deserves to be yes. treated with respect. Yes, I agree. I agree <laughs> with that. I feel I have two feelings. Yeah, respect the dead always, even though it's an interesting concept. But respect the dead, and then also I think when people go to these places, you're already thinking about the legend and right you know so like I think our mind will create every like extra stuff or like we'll put in supernatural reasons where it's like just a probably a natural reason but you know you're you're excited you're going to this place you know is haunted and you know your mind will add some extras to make it exciting for you yeah I mean if you're going there you're you're curious and you kind of want something to happen right and so that's already in your head yeah but you you and I differ on I believe in ghosts and you don't, so. Correct. Do you want to go to the Bell Witch Cave? No. Sounds like some bad juju. Yeah. I wish I knew the real story. But the fact that John Bell married a 12-year-old, then shot a man for saying something about his daughter. And owned slaves. Peach. Peach of a man. <laughs> he doesn't sound like my favorite guy. No. Absolutely not. I mean, I have questions, so. What's wrong with Lucy's dad? who let her get married at 12 and then I mean mean, 12 you're so little so little I can't think about it it's gross we know women get married younger yeah but that that seems that's really little I feel as though typically you're 16 at least or you're marrying somebody younger Younger, like you're 15 and they're 18. I don't this know. Is... That's depressing. I hate that. What do you I... think about the Richard Powell theory? How would he have pulled off all the voices? Gosh, I'm just realizing being a ventriloquist in the 1800s would have been like a superpower. Yeah, that's on. Yeah, the ventriloquist oh theory. I think that's that's part of it. I think both those theories are true. He would have always been there every time that the spirit spoke. Like there'd be a general, somebody who was always there no matter what. Yes, and that's not the case. Well, that is written down. True. I mean, he can't just live at their home. He's their school teacher. They would have noticed. They would have been like, yo, Dick, can you leave? Do you think they call him Dick in that day and age? Probably not. Dicky Powell, can you go please? Thanks. wonder when that nickname started. I don't know. It was a bad move. It's a weird one. Yeah, it is. Well, what are your last words? One, happy Halloween. Two... Respect the dead. Three, don't be an asshole. I was going to use the C word, but I think Americans are a little sensitive to that word. But, you know, don't be a jerk. Don't be a bad person. It's not that hard to be a good person. So cut your shit out or I'll send the ghosts on you. I mean, you and Kate are saying the same thing. Basically, humanity and the future of our Earth depends on that. So Yeah. So buck up, folks. Yeah. Yeah. All right, and who should listen? Ghost hunters, haunting people who like <laughs> them, things. People like scary stories and horror movies and books and um, colonials, peoples. Yeah, if you're still around. You're a vampire. <laughs> Take a listen. Let, let us tell your story. Yeah. Shoot a lot an email. <laughs> All right, do you have any last stories to throw me out of my world, or are you good? 
No, I don't have anyone to to combat. All right, great. Against, well, yeah. happy Halloween. Happy Halloween! You can find us on all the platforms at... Tea Time Crimes. You can email us at... Tea Time Crimes at gmail.com. And we will be back next week with just a regular old murder or some variation of it. And Mummer. Please, rate, please rate, review, like, subscribe wherever you get your podcast. Thank you so much for listening. Get us to 30! Get us to 30 ratings on Apple!